Hello and welcome to this live edition of Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. Our guest is Ryan Modesto, the CEO of 5i Research. You can ask questions of Ryan by typing them into the chat section on the right-hand side of your YouTube channel, which you're watching right now. And we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, during the show. Now, we'll get to Ryan in just a moment, uh, but first, uh, a bio board. Let's take a look at what this guy is all about. As mentioned, he is the CFO, uh, CEO rather, at 5i uh, Research. He has a CFA, that's why I juxtapose those two. He has a CFA designation. Now, in a past life, he uh, worked within RBC Wealth Management at PHN Investment Council, and he has a Bachelor of Business Administration in Finance at Wilfrid Laurier University. He's right here. Hello, Ryan. Nice to see you. You as well. Thanks for having me today. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people watching are, are tuning in because they know who you are, they know about 5i Research. There will be others who don't know. So. Uh, I like to do the, the classic sort of elevator pitch. Have you met somebody in an elevator, they ask you what 5i is and what it does, how would you describe it? So it's a conflict-free investment research and we focus on small to mid-cap Canadian equities. And really what we're trying to do is just find kind of uh, high quality companies with growing revenues where there's a lot of growth there, um, probably above a $100 million market cap. Um, but companies that no one's really talking about, you know, they don't get attention from the big banks because maybe they're just not doing enough deals to bring in money, um, but they're still just great companies. We're trying to bring the, uh, the attention of the, the, those stocks to the attention of our, our membership. Um, so, so the service is a classic kind of annual subscription type of basis. And with that, you get access to about 70 research reports. Uh, and we kind of follow those companies and update them, update those reports. Um, three model portfolios and so the model portfolios kind of try to track different types of investors so there's a more of a balanced type of investor an income one and then a more growth a higher risk growth type of model portfolio and then the final piece is the question and answer section which our members have really um, found valuable where you can ask us any question you want you know what's a tax-free savings account or something more in depth about a specific stock typically we can get an answer back to you within 48 hours um, and uh, there's also a searchable database with these questions. So the questions go back about, I think, probably four or five years now. So you can search a certain stock and see kind of the question and answer history of that stock. And it's, it's almost become a research tool on its own. Um, so there's been a lot of value with that tool in itself. And then we also have forums as a, as a kind of, a, uh, if you want to call it, an extra, extra piece to the, to the puzzle. That's great. And we're looking at uh, some details from your website right now. And uh, Capital Ideas, along with 5i Research, we have a an offer for you, which we'll tell you about a little bit later on uh, in the show. So a wealth of uh, information there and knowledge uh, that can be gleaned at 5i Research. Now you mentioned the, the conflict-free aspect to your business and uh, you of course work with uh, Peter Hodson, whom uh, many investors know uh, for a long time uh, in and around Bay Street in the investment community. So tell us about the, that conflict-free aspect and why that's important. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think we're probably one of the only only companies that, that are doing something like this where um, any stock we cover, um, actually, in, so we focus on the Canadian side of things and employees of 5i Research actually can't trade in Canadian stocks. So you don't have to worry that, you know, maybe we're holding the good stocks to ourselves and covering the other other names or that we have a position in a stock that we're then releasing information on. We don't um, personally benefit from, from the coverage we do. We're just trying to provide our, uh, our opinions about how we view a stock. And the idea is that you know, if we provide good research and hopefully good returns, then our members will keep on coming back to us uh, day in, day out. Uh, and, you know, and we also don't take any uh, money from the companies we cover either. So completely conflict-free. Um, it's a pretty unusual um, but unique uh, set up, I think, in the industry. Full disclosure, we, we do get compensated by uh, some of the companies that appear on the show, which we disclose uh, at the end of the interview, primarily awareness campaigns uh, for a lot of the companies that we uh, talk to. Now, let's get back to investing and your, your general approach, approach. You sort of touched on it a little bit, but uh, uh, how do you go about identifying stocks? Yeah, so um, I think it's interesting, everyone always likes to try to define themselves a certain style, that right? you're a value investor, you're a growth investor. And I've always been reluctant to do that because I think it sets you up to miss opportunities, right? If you were, if you're strictly a value investor, you probably never would have invested in Amazon. If you're strictly a growth investor over the last 10 years, you probably never would have invested in in um, Apple or a stock like that, right? And these are, and I, I obviously I'm using hindsight, these have been great stocks in the past, but I think the point is that, you know, you didn't have to be um, 
an extraordinary analyst to look at Amazon or Apple and say, you know what, these might be good investments. But if you are strictly a growth investor, um, you may have never touched um, uh, Apple. And if you're a value investor, you know, I'm only going to own something that has 16 times PE or lower. I don't think you ever would have touched a stock like Amazon, right? So, so I think it's important to kind of um, blend blend styles, and, and you definitely can gravitate towards a certain type of approach, um, and you want to do what's comfortable to you. But I think you don't want to exclude all the other opportunities out there. But so so if we were um, going to kind of define ourselves as something, it'd be definitely be. Uh, we're just looking for good companies with growing revenues. It's a bottom-up, fundamental type of approach, but we definitely uh, are biased more towards growth and momentum types of names. So we can um, run through some of the metrics that, that you know we look at for, for a company, if yeah, sure. you want to do that. Yeah, yeah so um, the, fir the first thing we really like to see is growing revenues. Um, if a company isn't growing their revenues, we generally won't even bother taking too much time to look at it, just because it's kind of, it's, it's a signal, right? If a, if a company can't grow their top line, it probably means you know in competition's increasing, or there just isn't a whole lot of demand, or um, maybe it's a mature business at this point in time. So definitely want revenue growth at the top line and consistent growth as well. You know, so whether it's a three-year, five-year trend, we're um, less interested in a company that has a single year of really high growth and then it's going to go back to you know one percent growth or something like that. So. Um, really, it's probably our you know our low bar is if there's no it, there has to be revenue growth at the company. Um, the next thing we, we would kind of turn to would probably be operating cash flows. Um, again, sort of a low bar type of thing where we, we're we're not necessarily looking for a specific you know cash flow yield on a company or magnitude of cash flows, but just cash flows that are um, positive, right? So we just want to make sure that they're able to pay pay their bills on a cash flow basis versus. Um, and, and this is always different than you know accounting earnings, net income, things like that, because you have non-cash items like depreciation and stuff like that. So, positive operating cash flow is another really important thing. Um, next, next, we just like companies with strong balance sheets. Um, we want them to have the flexibility to survive, you know, the next recession or the next 08 type of scenario. Um, and so, usually, this this means things like low debt, lots of cash, and, and you can find uh, this type of information through metrics like the debt to equity ratio. Um, interest coverage ratio, current ratio, things like that. So, so, but and, and you know, it, it kind of depends on you know what a good balance sheet is depends on a, the type of company and the type of sector they're in. Um, but you just don't want something that has no wiggle room for a management misstep or just a general economic slowdown. Um, n next, uh, kind of getting, I guess we're sort of moving down the income statement a bit now too, where it's profitability is the next thing and. And again, this can be company and industry specific. You know, some companies, like a tech company, should have, you know, something upwards of a 10% net margin and even higher. Where a, um, a grocer is probably going to have something closer to 3% net margin, right? But but the key is consistent margins um, and hopefully growing margins if they can. But that consistency and that trend is key. And then return on equity as well. So I mean, that's a that's a great tool to look at. Um, investor or, or management effectiveness where how are they taking all of your the cash you're giving them through buying their stock and how are they allocating that capital and are they generating good returns and generally you want to see kind of a consistent return on equity because um, that just shows you know a, um, a good tenure in, in the in the management team as far as ROE do you think that's something that investors maybe don't have a complete handle on and it, it's difficult to uh to interpret sometimes. I mean, you hear, oh, they have 20% ROI, but what does that mean exactly? Yeah, yeah, it's just the it's the returns that they're making on the the equity of the company. I'm sorry, I'm just repeating what ROE is, mm -hmm. um, but but essentially, you know, if if you go give a manager a dollar and you get ownership of that business, it's what the management team can do with that dollar and what kind of returns they can they can generate, right? And so you don't want to give money to a company that can't generate a positive return. And so this is different from the stock return, though, right? So um, you can have a company that generates solid returns by growing the earnings year in, year out, and that may not always be reflected in the stock. So this is kind of where the difference between fundamentals and what the stock market does in the short term vary, right? You can have a really strong company that has great fundamentals, and it just doesn't get recognized for, say, a year or two years, whatever the time is. But generally, if the company truly is a great company and they're um, consistently generating fundamental returns um, that'll show up in the stock price at some point. We're talking to Ryan Modesto, the CEO 
of Five Eye Research. Uh, he has some best ideas for you today. We're going to get to five of them. We're going to sprinkle them throughout the show and also uh, have Ryan talking about his investing strategies and theories as he has been. So maybe a good time uh, at this point of the show, Ryan, to get to, to one of your best ideas here. And it's Alaris Royalty. Uh, this company has had, a, according to them, a 15% annualized return since 2008, pays a yield of about 8% or so, a royalty model, obviously. It's done well over time, although the last few years, and we have a one-year chart here, but the last few years hasn't done especially well. So mm -hmm. uh, are you seeing opportunity here? Uh, is there a change in the business? So w what do you like about it? Yeah, so uh, we can step back because um, these picks are all kind of going to be the folks, the idea is they're going to be kind of uh, growth and income type of names. So that's sort of the theme theme I'm going with here. So Alaris is probably going to be the higher risk um, company on this list because they are kind of going through a bit of a, a turnaround period right now. So essentially they are a, they're, they're a lot like a private equity company, but instead of taking an equity position, it's a preferred share position. Um, and then, so they invest in these companies, and these companies pay them a continuous uh, distribution, which then gets paid out to the end shareholder. So they yield about eight percent right now. Um, and and what's happened is they've had two two investments that um, have have essentially become more or less insolvent for them. Um, so those distributions have stopped, and the payout ratio is starting to look pretty. Um, pretty tight for the company where, where maybe they would have had to make some changes to the dividend but they've sort of turned things around they've, they've reinvested in some of their current companies and they've also made a few new investments as well um, and so now it looks like the pay ratio is back to about 90% range um, so, so we like it because it's pretty cheap right now you get a nice yield from it but you have a bit of a management credibility issue so they've had two kind of really called bad investments um, and the worry is, are there going to be more bad investments? Um, so the management team really needs to uh, perform in the next couple of quarters because investors will be watching it very closely. Um, we think it looks like the, the trouble is kind of behind them at this point. And, and if they can kind of start um, you know, regaining that investor confidence, we think there's some potential with a company like Alaris. All right. So that's uh, Alaris Royalty from Ryan Modesto, one of the... Uh Best ideas from him today. We'll have more throughout the show. We're also getting some of your questions, and we'll get to those uh, in just a while. We just need to clear them with uh, Ryan to make sure we can talk about these companies. We have uh, Rob Faulkner, who is uh, taking part today. Larry Silverberg, Harry Jinku, George Duratny, and Sherbinskis, I think it's uh, pronounced. We have questions uh, on a number of stocks there. Now, let's get back to uh, uh, sort of uh, investing in general. Um, tell us about your, your track record, because I know that Peter has talked in the past about super winners, and if you have a stock that's double, it doesn't mean you have to sell it because if the fundamentals haven't changed, maybe it could go up 500% over the next uh, several years if yeah. you're not looking to, to do any trading with it. So um, what's the track record at 5 What are some of your, your, your great uh, hits? Yeah, so, so we have some, some pretty big winners. Um, one, the one that really jumps out is it's now the Stars Group, but um, we were covering it back when it was... I think around the three to five dollar ranges as a Maya gaming, mm -hmm. right. um, and that's been just so I think it's up over a thousand percent return now. Um, and that one's been it's been a really interesting stock to watch just because it's been a roller coaster ride of, of drama, um, li literal <laughs> drama. Um, right, but with they the did Quebec regulators uh, yeah, looking into the trading. Yeah, yeah. they did. Um, a really big acquisition of poker stars and it was kind of like the the little fish was eating eating the whale um, which is just a really rare you don't see uh, acquisitions like that rarely ever so it was um, it's very very interesting just kind of case study in in um, just a unique kind of business that that has found a way to, to grow and so now they continue to buy really strong brands they just purchased the sky betting and gaming um, to get them more into the the sports betting business the US markets are opening up um, so, so we really like that name still, and they've actually um, the stock's really pulled back lately. Uh, it looks like it's a lot of concern over over the debt load. But this is a company they've they've done these big acquisitions before. Um, they do have cash flows rolling in, kind of thing. So, so um, if it passes any predictor for the future for this company, we think they'll be able to, to manage the debt load uh, just fine. So, what's the what's the discipline there uh, for an investor, whereby you uh, uh, you have a winner, you're up two hundred percent, five hundred percent. Uh, and, and, and so what's the discipline to, 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 to not take profit if you don't have to and yeah. just sit on it? And maybe three years down the road, you're up uh, three times that. Yeah, yeah. You have to take the total portfolio into um, in, in the total portfolio view, essentially. You don't want your whole portfolio to become a bet on, on a single stock, right? So um, 
while, while you shouldn't fully sell out of, of those great companies, because if you continue to sell all of your winners, you're going to be left with a portfolio full of losers. Um, but, but you should be kind of just managing that risk and trimming the gains back. Now, now what level you should be doing that and what the appropriate weighting for a stock in a portfolio should be, it really gets down to a personal decision and how comfortable you are with a company. Um, but on the comfort side, you have to be careful because no matter how great you think a company is, the markets may not agree with you, right? So, and even if the fundamentals check out, you know, you could have a, some sort of political tweet come out and it could just totally destroy your stock. And if that's, you know, 10% or 25% of your portfolio, there goes that amount of your, your um, life savings essentially um, potentially down the drain, right? So, so it's all about position sizing and managing that position, position size. Um, but, but even if you have whatever the amount is and say, say you have 5% of your portfolio and it doubles to 10%, so you, and you take those gains off and you just trim it back to 5%. If it's still a good stock, it can still double again at those levels and you can trim trim back more and you, you can keep doing that, right? So you, you still share in the upside of what's a good company, but you're managing that risk of it just becoming too big of a, uh, of a position in the portfolio. Makes sense. All right, on to another best idea here from Ryan. It's Payson Systems, PSI on the TSX, does data management for uh, drilling rigs, pays a dividend. Uh, was doing pretty well until 2014, and then the whole uh, energy sector rolled over. And now here we are in a, in, a, in a painful situation for the energy sector. But again, is this a situation where you see opportunity? Yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're doing a really good job right now. And they have about a, a I think the stat's 65% market share of, or they're in 65% of all drilling rigs in the Western Hemisphere. So that's a pretty big number. So, so they already have a good kind of, you know, installed base and they're doing a good job. They, they do like a rig optimization and they drive efficiencies of these rigs. Um, but they're, they're kind of upselling and cross-selling new services like data analytics and things like that. So, um, and the, the conversions to these new services have been pretty strong and their current, their, their core business is, is growing uh, quite strongly as well. Um, we think it's an interesting play on the growing, kind of the, if you want to call it the shale boom in the U.S. Um, and it's a neat way where you don't have to own oil exposure directly, right? So if the, if the oil industry continues to grow in North America, a company like this can continue providing those services to those companies and benefit, but they're, they're not necessarily as sensitive to um, oil, the, the daily swings of oil as, as other companies will be. Now, mind you, if you know, you'd, the, the oil market continues and companies start going out of business, the story starts to change a bit, but, but we, we like how it's been holding up in the recent downturn as well. It's, it's done, it's a bit of, it can, it can kind of swing, but it's actually held, held its own in, in the recent downturn, we think. So nice, nice yield on it too, I think yields about 3%, which is, uh, makes it interesting. There was a fair size spike there in the last few weeks. That was what? Uh, earnings, they, they earnings, had a okay. good earnings report. And it, it seems, I think probably if you looked back and tacked on a little info button on each of those spikes, it's probably the, uh, the earnings, because they've been beating earnings by a pretty good clip over the last, uh, last couple quarters. Mm -hmm. Nice looking chart there. All right, uh, Ryan, now we've got a couple of best ideas out of uh, Ryan Modesto so far. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll get to your questions. we got a handful that we'd like to get to. As we head to break, we want to tell you about a special offer from 5 Eye Research. It's a free 30-day trial, and what you get is all of 5 Eye's reports. And if you sign up for this 30-day uh, trial, you'll also get a free updated report on 15 companies, complete with summaries, a report card, an examination of their evaluation, and a lot more than that. So to sign up for your free 30-day trial and to get this free report, go to 5iResearch.com. You're watching Capital Ideas TV live with Ryan Modesto, CEO of 5i Research. More of his best ideas and your questions after this. So we try to not focus on the noise of what everyone else is doing. Halo Labs is a manufacturer of oils and concentrates. We have, in the period of 18 months, taken a company from zero revenue in Oregon to being the second largest manufacturer in, in Oregon. We're not trying to be all things to all people. We're heads down execution people. Because what we do, we do quite well. And we don't know of any other group that does it better than ourselves. We feel like we're the wave of the future in terms of how people test for things. Uh, we anticipate being the first sample to answer instrument that can process up to 22 pathogens at a time. Whatever you want to test for, you can do it on your own. Uh, you don't have to ship it away to a lab. You don't have to have an expensive microbiologist. It's something you can do on site. You collect that sample, 
you input it into the machine, you hit a button, an hour later you get the result you're looking for. RavenQuest Biomed is really three things, innovation, science, and opportunity. Orbital gardens are really cool technology. We've now converted them to the point of which the plant uh, rotates around a center light. What we have done is created the control technology and changes to some of these gardens which allow for more nutrient impact into the plants. So what it allows for us is to get high density within a very small space, which overall is going to lower our capital costs and our operating costs. Welcome back to Capital Ideas TV, live with Ryan Modesto. He's the CEO of 5 Eye Research. Put your questions uh, for our guest in the chat section on the right-hand side of our YouTube channel, which you're watching right now. Ryan has given you a few of his best ideas. You've got three more to come. We're taking your questions. Uh, unfortunately, the questions that have been asked so far are not companies that Ryan is that familiar with. So uh, if you want to ask about another name, uh, perhaps something uh, maybe a little bit more mainstream, uh, give it a try, and we'll have uh, uh, Ryan see if he can uh, answer it for you. So let's get back to uh, some questions here, again, about uh, investing in general. What about uh, red flags? I know you say you meet management occasionally, you listen to conference calls, but when you look at a, a company's books, w w what are alarm bells that, that go off when you see I mean, aside from obvious things like a huge debt load or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Looking at like, like a stock specific level, um, high high dividends and really high uh, payout ratios is definitely can be, um, I wouldn't say a red flag, but it can be a risk. So high dividends can be a red flag in the sense that the, the market is trying to signal something to you that, you know, something's not quite right. So, you know, I need a 10% yield to justify owning it. Um, we, we think a lot of investors get trapped in these types of uh, types of names because the yield looks so attractive, right? It's a, you call it a no-brainer. And then what happens is that um, as the stock goes down, you're, you're more um, happy to hold on to it because you're getting that, you know, you're getting that 10% yield still, but, but slowly that, that yield starts to look um, pretty puny if the stock's down 20, 30, 40% in a year, right? So, um, and, and typically um, the markets are smart. The markets are lots of people looking at lots of stocks out there. Um, so when, when there's a really high yield, it's all, oftentimes a signal that you know, maybe there's a, di um, a dividend cut on its way or there's just something going on that you may not be thinking about, you may not, may not be seeing that um, makes this, uh, this payout unsustainable. So that's probably one, one red flag that often I think people look at it and see it as you know, this great value dividend opportunity, um, but it's often the opposite. Uh, Falling revenues, it's like sounds so simple, but it's uh, falling revenues is definitely a red flag because why why are revenues going down? Um, has something changed at the company where you know demand just isn't there anymore, or maybe competition's increasing and and some company even management team's not aware of yet is just stealing uh, stealing business from them, so to speak. Um, another one would kind of would probably be just uh, promises never never being met, right? So. If a company's telling you that, you know, revenues, we're going to hit whatever revenue in a, in a year or two years, and there's just never any um, uh, momentum on, on that goal, I think that's a red flag because it might show that the management team doesn't know the business quite as well as they think they do, or that um, they're just kind of telling a story to, to keep you interested kind of thing. And I, I would say the same thing about earnings where you get... Um, a lot of companies that are saying, you know, the earnings will come, the earnings will come, and they never, never do, right? So, so we'd often be careful, careful with a, a company that has, you know, a 10-year history and they've never had a positive earnings or positive operating cash flow. Like the, the we're, we're okay with companies that have negative earnings, but they need to come at some point, right? So um, that can often be a red flag that, that if, they're, if they've had, had a lot of time and those earnings haven't come in, they, they may never come in. What are your thoughts in general here? I have a question here from uh, uh, Sherbinsky's, I think he's pronouncing it, uh, on, on the, the cannabis sector. He's asking about Aurora. I don't know if you mm -hmm. cover that, but to just cannabis uh, in general. When you look at the landscape, do you see companies that are worthwhile or, or is a lot of it just concepts or a lot of them just hugely inflated in terms of valuation? Yeah, it, it's, it's a 
a space we've been, um, you should say, conservative on or, or negative on. Um, I, I think the way to view it is that it's hard to invest in a company that swings, you know, 10% up or down any given day, right? So that's, you know, uh, it's a very specific investor we think that can that can handle that type of volatility. So. Um, is the marijuana sector here and is it real? It's, it's here to stay. We're, we're pretty confident of that. Um, is there growth opportunity in it? Definitely. But are the current companies and the valuations that they're trading at, um, is that, are they going to be here in five, five years, ten years? That's harder to say. And it's also harder to say what the co competitive landscape is going to be like, right? How many new companies are going to enter in the space and start taking market share or driving down margins and things like that? So, so there's just there's potential there, but it's, there's just still a lot of uncertainty. And I mean, we're into maybe the, if you even want to call it one quarter of real retail sales right now, right? And and it's just not enough to to determine um, what margins are going to look like or what the competitive picture is going to look like even five, well, one year down the road, let alone five years down the road. So there's potential, but we think a lot of these companies are being priced for, for uh, perfection. The, the valuations are really high, um, and we think it's kind of a, they're, they're not just priced for you know, dominating Canadian markets, but for dominating global markets and um, all the derivatives of the products as well. And, and it may, it may, that may be the case for some of the companies out there, but that's probably a pretty optimistic scenario, and that doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room to be wrong uh, as well. And um, we always want that kind of margin of error, margin of safety. Ryan, let me just throw some names at you here. You can say yeah or nay. These are from some of our viewers. Uh, North American Construction Group, High Arctic, uh, uh, Whitecap, any of those you want to you could talk about? Um, Aritzia. Let's it's go. O it's okay. If, if yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Let's, I mean, let's keep on seeing it, see if anyone's come in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, keep keep trying, everybody. That's okay. I mean, you can't know everyone, and uh, uh, but that's fine. Now, speaking of um, stocks, which we are through the whole show. How about where are we here? Yeah, let's uh, let's do another best idea here from uh, from Ryan Modesto. Now, Parklawn is a company uh, who's the CEO we've interviewed here on Capital Ideas, uh, Andrew Clark. That was several months ago. I was quite impressed by him, impressed by a lot of the CEOs who come in, but he just he just uh, reeked of CEO. He just struck you as, you know, if you, you go to, to a casting call, he might get uh, he might get hired. So uh, cemeteries, funeral homes, uh, they grow through acquisition, through organic growth. Uh, successful story. It's kind of faltered a little bit, as you see here on the on the one-year chart. I believe they missed their numbers, but um, you're recommending it. And again, I'm, I'm assuming you're seeing in these choppy markets, you're seeing some opportunity here. Yeah, yeah. We, we think um, with the volatility and the kind of the um, uncertainty going on in the markets right now, this is an interesting name to look to. It's nice because, as you pointed out, it has turned down a bit, so the valuations come down a little bit on the name. Um, but, you know, when you look at the base case for this, this company, it's sort of a dark turn, but there's always going to be demand for their services, right? And it's, so it's the, um, on an organic level, it's probably going to be kind of a, a population growth type of Top line growth for the company, right? Because people unfortunately die. Uh, um, but this company is also getting more growth from the acquisition side of things as well. So, so while the the core, the base of the business is slower growth, they can ramp that growth up by going out and buying companies, and then kind of driving efficiencies and using their best practices for the companies they're purchasing. Um, and and so far, they're managing the balance sheet um, prudently. You know, they're not they're not uh, highly levered. Um, they pay a nice distribution that should be able to, to grow over time as well. Um, and we think it's just one of those names that, that you're paying up a bit in valuation for it, but you're paying that because there is some certainty and stability in the consistent revenue streams that should come in. It's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, death and taxes. So yeah. they, they deal in death. And, and uh, Andrew is very matter of fact about that. I mean, you could look at it in a, in a grim way, but it's, it's a business. and. Yeah. Uh, and families need uh, their loved ones taken care of, so so that's where they operate. Let me ask you about the, the current market conditions. Do, do you find these really difficult as a as a researcher and a, and a, a stock picker, or are you are you seeing a lot of uh, opportunities now because of, of what's happened? Yeah, so it's a it's a bit of both. I mean, it's been a pretty uh, it's been a tough month month or two. It's with the uh, the market decline that's happened, and it's when you're looking at the um, asset classes. I think there's only two. Um, of the major asset classes, there's two, two that are positive. It's the U.S. and I think Chinese um, fixed income securities or something like that. Oh, right? I'm in so, those. Yeah, Absolutely. of course, of course, right? Everyone is I now. nailed that a long time ago. <laughs> so it's, um, 
you know, it, it's been a, been a market where there's been nowhere to hide. Um, so probably most people are down, down on the year, no matter what you've done kind of thing. Um, so it's been really tough on that side of things. But, but with these type of markets now comes opportunity, right? So you have on the, uh, the U.S. side, you know, S&P 500 is trading about 15 or 16 times earnings. So over the last 10 years, probably what was the main complaint? It was valuation, right? Uh, markets are too expensive. I can't justify owning them at these levels. But now you have a market that's actually at average levels. Um, and so, so we think if you're kind of one of those people that were really nervous about that, that highly valued stock, now there's a, probably an opportunity to, to start looking at, at least from a, um, at the market level. So um, a lot of companies with higher valuations have been, um, been punished recently, especially the, the tech names. Um, and, and even a lot of companies we really like on the Canadian side have been, uh, they've, they've had quarters that missed estimates, but was not a, um, a game-changing quarter by any means, and they, uh, they got slammed with, um, with results. So um, we think that opens up a lot of uh, companies to better valuations now and maybe better, better entry points for, with a, for a long-term, long-term point of view. All right, very good. Uh, Ryan Modesto is our guest, the CEO of Five Eye Research. He's giving you his best ideas and investing strategies today and taking your questions. I hate to put you on the spot. I'm just going to throw some names at you here. Uh, some of these, I think, and thank you for, for sending these in, by the way, and, and taking part. Um, some of these, uh, I can only assume that you probably would not deal with because they're quite small. But how about uh, Maple Leaf Foods or Dream Global, uh, Spin Master? Diversified royalty. We do Spin Master. Oh, let's do that's Spin Master. Yeah. Yay, we got one. Okay, so <laughs> that's from Terry uh, Terry Kotyek, uh, Spin Master, the, the the toy uh, company. Yeah, yeah. And so Paw Patrol is like the is the big brand, but they also have um, oh no, the name's gonna escape me now. They're like the the Furbies, they break out of an egg and, and yell at you or something. I know, like I know that. what you mean. So they were they were I think last Christmas is a craze craze toy kind of thing. So. Um, there's a lot of disruption in this industry right now because you have the Toys R Us bankruptcy. So there's a lot of uncertainty in companies like this and Mattel and names like that. So, I, so we think markets are just really kind of nervous about what's happening, um, about how they're going to you know, sell, sell their goods. But um, when you look at a company like Spin Master, they're now trading, I think, like 16 times earnings. And they, they have some of the best toy brands out there. I mean, I think Paw Patrol is, you know, maybe it's getting to be an older um, brand that they use. but it's uh, it's still one of the the strongest. It's probably the most popular brand out there right now, as far as kids' toys go. Um, but they've also done a good job at diversifying their business, so they don't have to rely on you know those big hit products year to year. Um, they they've bought like Etch a Sketch, and um, I think it's Gund Toys uh, with like the the bears and a bunch of kind of outdoor toy product companies as well. So so they've really gone out, purchased companies that have more of a probably a steady demand versus that you know, hot fad toy type of um, cycle that, that companies can get stuck in. So uh, we think it's a solid name and they do most of their business in kind of this holiday season, right? So uh, we think it's um, at this point a lot of bad news is being priced in and if you just kind of, uh, we, we think it's a company that will probably, if they're going to surprise, it's probably going to be to the upside because we think a lot of the bad news is, is in the stock at this point. Do you have a rating on it? Yes, we do. And it's uh, off the top of my head. I, yeah, I can't no, remember. It's a positive rating. It's though. a positive yeah. rating. Okay. <laughs> and, and and just so so people know, you you, you guys rate uh, in terms of like you're you're, yeah. like, you're like teachers. You yeah. get yeah. an A or a B. Or yeah. A and so so we're really looking at the, the quality of the company, right? Because um, because we're of the belief that if uh, if if it's a good company, even if you pay a bit of a premium for it, um, or your timing's not perfect, over the long term things will work out because that company will continue to generate generate returns and they'll justify that. Um, that multiple or something if they're growing fast enough uh, you know that 20 times earnings multiple will probably look cheap um, looking back in in five years kind of thing so we're really focused more on the quality and then we take we've kind of put a, a value valuation lens over that that rating as well so you know if something has the the best balance sheet out there and the best income statement out there you know that would be a an a type of company but it's trading it 15 times sales, then we might dial back that that mm -hmm. rating a bit to a to a B plus or or whatever it is. Now you talked about Alaris royalty as one of your best ideas earlier. How about a diversified royalty? Is that one that you follow? Similar yeah, model? we don't follow it closely because um, just the that high yield has has made us nervous in the past. Um, I, I know I know they do the royalty business, but I haven't been. Um, looked at that one too closely uh, recently. Okay, fair enough. That was a question from Wild Wild Wheels Darren. 
And we have one from uh, My Pipolino, uh, Cineplex. Does that intrigue you? Yeah, yeah. So um, Cineplex is the name we cover. Uh, they've been get gotten. They've been beat, beaten up over the last couple of uh, of months or over the last year, really. Um, so they essentially have. You could probably call it a monopoly in the theater business, right? So obviously the concern, though, is that people don't go out and watch movies anymore because you can just sit in your home and watch Netflix. And to a degree, we think that there is some, you know, attrition in um, attendance. Uh, because of things like Netflix and just being able to, to download movies and all that kind of thing. But people still want to go out and, and watch movies, right? So, so we think there's still a business there. Um, I, I think my, my qualm with the company is that they seem to be doubling down on the things that investors aren't big fans of right now. So um, they're moving into uh, arcade gaming and the, there's one in downtown Toronto. Oh, the, the rec room. The rec room, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're d kind of doubling down on this idea of large um, physical retail spaces and getting people out to these spaces to have, have a good time and spend money. Right. And that's fine, but it's very capital intensive. Right. And, and sorry, Top Golf is another one that they're Top Golf, yeah, they, right. they've partnered with Top Golf, so they're not like the, the sole owner of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they have a partnership with Top Golf as well. So. Um, yeah, so it just seems like they're doubling down on what people are, are worried about, and, and it, it may work out, but it's capital intensive, costs a lot of money to do these things, and the rollout's pretty slow. I mean, uh, to, to build a, you know, a brand new building and get interest in it and, uh, across Canada, and, and within Canada you have fewer you know, economic centers as well, so, so I think it's just um, we're not a huge fan of the, the diversification strategy they're doing right now. Uh, but they have some other interesting interesting units where they do advertising um, and like like brand, like a billboard, uh, digital billboards, things like that. And that, that's actually growing really well. And they have an esports business also, which um, I don't think they're they're giving they're they're talking about enough. I, th I think there's some some interesting potential behind that business, and they just need to clarify a bit more. Um, or sh or sh just tell that story a bit more to investors. So um, it's pretty cheap, got a decent yield right now, and you know the business isn't going anywhere uh, tomorrow, so to speak. Um, but we just would like to um, a bit of a adjustment maybe to the the, the messaging, I guess they're giving right. the investors. Yeah. When I was at BNN, this is going back, I want to say three years at least, if not longer. Uh, Patrick Horan would come on from Agilith, and he was short Cineplex at that time, and that's when the stock was doing really well. Yeah. So his short did not work out for the longest time, and I don't, I don't know him very well. I don't know if he kept that short on, mm -hmm. but if he did, he would have done well, because he, he believed there was that big structural shift happening, mm -hmm. which we're seeing with the over the top and watching from home. And, but you also have the argument that people still like to go out. Yes. And yeah. so, so do you believe in that, that structural shift and that it's a declining business, or it will remain strong, and a lot of it is based on what, what Hollywood sends it? Yeah, yeah. I think, now that, um, I think that excuse of, um, they can only do as good as the movie movie slate. I think that can only go so far, right? The, the business has to also realize that, okay, if the movie slate's not going to be good for the next 10 years or people aren't just interested in the movies that are being made, we need to also do something that diversifies the business away from that also, right? So you're not reliant on what Hollywood sends you every every quarter. Um, so, so there is some truth to that, but I, but I think that that conversation needs to that's kind of an old playbook now, and then that conversation needs to change a little bit. Um, but it's interesting on, on, the, on the shorting, because it also shows how uh, difficult it, it can be to be, um, how, how the, sh the short side of things can be so difficult, right? Because uh, what's the saying? The markets can remain uh, irrational longer than, than you can remain solvent kind of thing, so. Right, well, he, uh, he, he was right. He was just maybe yeah. two or three years early, so <laughs> I, I should, uh, I should track him down because I know he was on BNN the other day. I wanna, I'm curious about that. All right, so let's get to another best idea. We'll take another short break after that and then get back to some of your, your questions. So Transcontinental, when you hear that name, you think old school media, mm -hmm. uh, hard copy magazines and, and local newspapers and so on. So uh, it surprised me in a sense that the, uh, the stock has done really well, although it got hit really hard here fairly recently. And you say they're in the midst of a, a transformation. They made that packaging company purchase so 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 why this company why now yeah so they, they purchased this company called uh, Covaris it's a flexible packaging company in the US and I, I mean, they're like the they're in the top 10 of flex pack companies uh, in terms of size in, in North America so it's a really big acquisition and it's a it was a big transition into they've been sort of easing their way into the um, 
into the packaging space over the last couple of years, but this was their big, big move into it. So it was, it was, it was a big purchase, but it looked like it was a pretty good acquisition um, uh, in terms of valuation. Uh, but the recent quarter just didn't come in like the markets wanted, and they um, obviously just slammed the stock because of it. But now you have a stock that's that's yielding about four four percent. I think they're trading at something like like four six times cash flows, um, and and not to not to mention that the business they purchase, which is a packaging business, tends to be stable revenue earnings type of businesses, right? Um, and these are companies that generally are rewarded with a 15 to an 18 times earnings multiple. So, so you get, it seems like there's just a divergence in, um, in valuation that this company is being rewarded. It's just not being rewarded for that packaging business that they're now transitioning into. And it might take some time, it might take another quarter for them to, uh, to really kind of get things running. But um, we, we think there's some real potential there and it's still being valued like a traditional printing company that's losing revenues. Um, but also, people also forget that the the printing side. It's I mean, not not a business that you'd want to own as a pure play, but it's still generating positive cash flows, kind of thing. It's still um, um, sure it's in decline, but there's still a business there as well. Interesting. All right. So the best ideas so far from Ryan Modesto, the CEO of Five Eye Research, uh, Alaris Royalty, based on Systems, Parklawn, and Transcontinental. One more best idea. Some more investing advice. More of your questions. Uh, in just a second. But as we head to break, we want to tell you about a special offer from Capital Ideas Media. It's a free 30-day trial to our premium weekly Capital Ideas Digest. You'll get free access to four new issues, plus access to our archive of digests, replete with investment ideas. The digest is usually reserved for our premium subscribers, so you can see what you uh, might be missing by going to capitalideasmedia.com backslash 30-day trial backslash, and the 30 is written in the digits of three zero and then a lowercase day trial capitalideasmedia.com backslash 30 day trial backslash and you can get that trial and uh, check out our uh, weekly digests you're watching capital ideas tv live with ryan modesto we'll have more uh, right after this uh, more ideas more of your questions stay tuned We feel like we're the wave of the future in terms of how people test for things. Uh, we anticipate being the first sample to answer instrument that can process up to 22 pathogens at a time. Whatever you want to test for, you can do it on your own. Uh, you don't have to ship it away to a lab. You don't have to have an expensive microbiologist. It's something you can do on site. You collect that sample, you input it into the machine, you hit a button, an hour later you get the result you're looking for. So we try to not focus on the noise of what everyone else is doing. Halo Labs is a manufacturer of oils and concentrates. We have, in the period of 18 months, taken a company from zero revenue in Oregon to being the second largest manufacturer in, in Oregon. We're not trying to be all things to all people. We're heads down execution people. Because what we do, we do quite well. And we don't know of any other group that does it better than ourselves. So we try to not focus on the noise of what everyone else is doing. Halo Labs is a manufacturer of oils and concentrates. We have, in the period of 18 months, taken a company from zero revenue in Oregon to being the second largest manufacturer in, in Oregon. We're not trying to be all things to all people. We're heads down execution people. Because what we do, we do quite well and we don't know of any other group that does it better than ourselves.
Welcome back to Capital Ideas TV Live with Ryan Modesto. He's going to give you one more uh, best idea today, some more investing advice, and we're going to take a few more questions. We'll get to those right now. In fact, we had a question from, or have a question from Jules and Bling, and he wanted to know about uh, Knight Therapeutics, GUD. Yeah, so Knight, Knight's an interesting one where we've been, we get a lot of grief on it because they have, I think, like about 60% of their um, market cap is in cash. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they haven't, it's kind of been a story of eventually they'll invest the cash and something will happen and they, they still haven't done anything. Um, and so, you know, when the markets are going up and they're kind of going sideways, um, you might get some grief on it. But now in this market that we have where markets are falling or have been falling relatively quickly, um, you actually see some money flowing into a name like this because it's more conservative and has some safety because of that um, huge, uh, large cash balance. So, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's part of it's a play on the management team with John, Jonathan Goodman. Um, who, who ran Paladin initially. Right. Um, and, you know, they've been making investments, and so far their, their investments have been, they haven't been um, large in terms of the size of the company, but um, they've still been making successful investments that have been generating returns for them. They've been getting approvals on different drugs. So, you know, it's, it's a long-term play, but we think over time um, they'll start putting more and more cash to work and, and things will look out. And, and it's one of those names that, that it's okay to have a couple, cons not every stock has to, go off like gangbusters, mm -hmm. right? It's all about diversification. It's okay to have a name like this that, you know, in a market like uh, that that sees a downturn like we're seeing now, um, you can rely on, probably rely on it a bit more because over half of that value of that company is in cash, right? So um, we think it's an interesting name still. Right, and, and you're right in saying that it has, the story has taken a long time to play out because this mm -hmm. goes back three, four years, if not longer. Mm -hmm. uh, Goodman has a great reputation. Paladin Labs did so well, uh, shareholders did so well, but it has taken a while to evolve and they've been sitting on this cash for a long time. But uh, interesting thoughts there on Knight Therapeutics. Let's get to uh, Andrew Gray, a number, sorry, not Andrew, uh, Greg Lotto, he had a number of questions here. The one that you uh, want to talk about is Descartes Systems. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, they came up with earnings after the bell or this morning and uh, it was record revenue, record adjusted EBITDA. Uh, we did a cover story on them. I looked at it uh, uh, March 6th. Stock went up about 30% after that, so we were, we were quite happy with that for our subscribers. But then uh, it's, it's rolled over since then and sort of consolidated those gains. But uh, tell us about your thoughts on Descartes. Yeah, so this one's actually held up pretty well in the downturn, especially considering a lot of the downturns have been um, focused on tech stocks as well. So, and this is kind of Descartes, a classic, you know, higher valued, um, high margin type of company. Um, they, they've held up pretty well, largely matched the market on the downside. I, th I think they're actually above the market at this point. Um, what we like about this, what we like about this company is that they, uh, their forecast is always um, what we're going to do in the next quarter is what we did in the most previous, in, in the most recent quarter. So, and I think that's just a testament to the, um, the stickiness of the revenues and the consistency of the revenue. So, so they do, uh, they essentially operate like a logistics platform, and, uh, and I like to view it as that they take all the stuff that transportation companies and shipping companies don't want to deal with. So, um, like filing customs paper and things like that. Um, and they also kind of, it, it, they've created a network where um, people within, or companies within the supply chain can kind of deal with each other and, um, uh, you know, find efficiencies and things like that. So um, really sticky business. And we think it's one of those things where the world's becoming more complicated, trade's becoming more complicated. So companies that can provide a service that, you know, focus in and do this, this these niche kind of things better. and maybe even at a lower cost, um, we think it's an interesting um, kind of a, a model for the company. And it's, you know, it's classic software as a service, recurring revenues, pretty high margin business, and you, you're paying for a higher valuation for it. Um, but, but over the long term, it's, they've justified that valuation and they like to go out, make kind of smaller acquisitions, tuck them into the business and sort of cross sell their, to their customers and add features, which um, their current customers or their legacy customers will also want. So there's just a lot of growth um, or a lot of torque they get with every, every acquisition they make. And this has quietly been a very successful Canadian story going yeah. back, what, 10 years, if not longer? Yeah, yeah. and they're, they're in our backyard out, out in Waterloo, where, where we are. And, and th I think, you know, when we think about 5i Research, this is like a classic company that, that we like, right? It's a, it's a great Canadian story that nobody knows about, nobody talks about either. And um, Is that because they don't deal with Bay Street at all? 
I, I, you know, I don't know why. I think it's, I, I don't know why, honestly, why, um, uh, you know, there's other companies like Constellation Software. It, it could be that they just don't get talked about uh, on, you know, because they don't do deals and things like that. But, but a company like Descartes does, they, they go out and buy a lot of companies still. So they're, they're definitely making the bankers some money, I'd assume. Um, yeah, it's, um, I, I don't know why uh, we don't hear about these companies more often. That, that's kind of one of the things we want. We want to bring great Canadian stories out to, uh, to people because they're out there, right? And it doesn't have to all be energy and banks kind of thing. So For sure, there's, yeah. there's a, lot of, a lot of great companies. <laughs> you can there. make money on those, but that can get kind of boring after a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, last question here from uh, one of our viewers. My Pipolino, uh, your thoughts on Severia? I know this has been uh, a winner for you. And, it, we, and when we talked to Peter Hodson, it's actually one of the first digests I did, which mm -hmm. is August of 2016. Severia was a, a pick. It's done really well. Yeah, yeah, this is a um, uh, stock that's done really well for our members. It's in our model portfolio as well, so it's performed well there. Um, their recent quarter, I, it's interesting, their recent quarter I think it beat on revenues and but they were shy on on earnings. Essentially earnings were, were flat for the quarter um, and Marcus didn't like that so they, um, they they punished the stock if you, if you look at the look at the chart but over the long term it's still done well and they're still um, in 2019 they're expected to grow their revenues by 40 percent with this acquisition they've made. Um, so you know it's not like the growth story isn't there anymore. Um, demographics are good in the sense that they support um, or help people stay in their homes and get in their homes and get in their car and, and all that kind of thing. So it's a, na it's a name we like and um, you know it's, it's a probably classic case of if you thought it was you know if the one thing keeping you out of it was the valuation and it did have a high valuation that's kind of come down now it's closer to 18, 19 times earnings which we think is pretty reasonable for uh, a growth company. And that's a nice segue into our last best idea from you. From you. They go hand in hand here. Severia, uh, you heard what they do. And now we move on to uh, Chartwell Retirement. Mm -hmm. Speaking of demographic plays, stock's been in a range of, say, 14 to 16 for the last uh, while, the last year or so, if not longer. Yeah. We're looking at it here. So, uh, so tell us about... Uh, chart well and, and why investors may want this in their portfolio. Yeah, yeah so, so the latest dip has made it uh, a bit more attractive on valuation. Uh, it's a nice little yield, about 4%. That'll probably grow consistently year over year. Um, and it just as a demographic play, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, people need places to live. They do operate retirement homes and kind of more um, probably higher end retirement homes. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a slow growth, steady eddy type of name. But again, kind of in the context of a, of a rough market where people may be realizing that, that they had too much risk or um, they weren't quite comfortable with the volatility they thought they were comfortable with, a name like Chartwell could be, could be one of those ones to consider that, that offers a bit of that stability in your portfolio with, with a pretty nice yield as well. All right, very good. The best ideas from Ryan Modesto once again, Alara's Royalty, Payson Systems, Parklawn, Transcontinental, and Chartwell Retirement. Uh, and he took a number of your questions there as well. So lastly, uh, is there one bit of investment advice that you can give to a self-directed investor right now when they're, they're looking at their portfolio, they're looking at the market, so many question marks, what's, what's the advice you can give? Yeah, it's um, pretty boring advice, I think, but it'd, <laughs> it'd be uh, just, just think long-term, right? It's um, don't focus on the single quarter. Like you, you need to look at, look at what's going on at companies and take into consideration, but you know, one bad quarter doesn't make um, a company with 10-year history of success, a bad company all of a sudden. Um, there's a lot of noise out there in the short term. You've got to do your best to, to kind of filter the noise out and, and realize what's important. So, so think long term. Don't get bogged down in the, the quarterly cycle. You know, watch for trends that are happening and, and if something really bad is happening out there. But um, stocks are going to go up and down. That's, the, that's the, nat the, the nature of the beast kind of thing. So um, if you kind of think past that single year and think over that three year, five year time frame and focus on the fundamentals, companies that are generating real cash flows that, that by being an equity owner you own a piece of uh, and think of it as like a, more of as a business than a stock. I, I think that's, um, that sets you self, yourself up for long term success. Great stuff today, Ryan. We appreciate you coming in. Thanks for having me. Let's do it again. Sounds good. All right. Very good. Ryan Modesto, the CEO of Five Eye Research. Our thanks to him. Thanks to you as well for watching and for uh, participating in the chat. Now, as we wrap things up, we want to remind you of the special offers from Five Eye Research and Capital Ideas. Become a client of Five Eye Research today and receive absolutely free an updated report on 15 companies, complete with summaries, a report card, and an examination of their valuations and a lot more. Go to fiveeyeresearch.com. Now, as far as Capital Ideas, we're offering a free 30-day trial. This gives you immediate access to our premium weekly digest. These are the uh, research-based actionable investment ideas 
that are reserved for our paying subscribers. You'll get access to four issues and our complete archive. Uh, you can find out what you've been missing. Just go to capitalideasmedia.com backslash 30 day trial as you see on your screen there. Now, thank you again for watching and taking part. If you missed any part of the show, you can watch it on our website or on our Capital Ideas TV YouTube channel. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time. Take care.